This is Jay Rogers. I am the director of the Forerunner, and this is now part four of my series on Sola Scriptura. And in this one, we're going to look at how the canon was received very early on, like at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, and not decided hundreds of years later. There's these two extreme views among Christians. Uh, one view says that right after the last apostle died, there appeared this uh, bound New Testament that appeared magically in all the churches. And that's not really held by that many people, but some people have that idea that the New Testament came as a whole unit rather than as separate books. And then there's another view that, said that says that it was decided by the church through a process that took hundreds of years. And it wasn't until like the year 400 that we had a canonical list of the New Testament. And that is patently not true. I'm going to show in this video how by the end of the, the first century, beginning of the second century, like up to about maybe 115 AD, there were men in the church who wrote other letters that were referencing all the books in the, in the New Testament. So if we go to this article right here, uh, this is um, uh, by a man named Luke J. Wilson, who has an excellent website, and he shows how Polycarp and others show the early use of the New Testament. So the three church fathers were um, first Clement of Rome, who wrote around 96 AD. And then there were Polycarp of Smyrna. And uh, the other person was called Ignatius of Antioch. So they lived in three different places in the Roman Empire. Uh, Rome, which is in um, modern day Italy, obviously. Then you had Polycarp of Smyrna, which is in modern day Turkey. And then Antioch, which is in Clement, um, Ignatius of Antioch, which is in modern day Lebanon. So they were in very different parts of the world and they knew each other. They corresponded with each other. Uh, Pol There's a letter uh, of Ignatius to Polycarp, for instance, and they, they had already received the canon of the New Testament. So in just the letter of Polycarp itself, we have all of these references to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st uh, Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Hebrews, 1st Peter, 2nd Peter, 1st John, 3rd John, and Jude. So that's 20 out of the 27 books. Uh, then we have Ignatius, who mentions uh, 17 books, and there are some others that Ignatius mentions that um, Polycarp does not. Then there are other witnesses, including First Clement, and he has 14 of the 27 books. Uh, then there are other sources as well, but I just want to stick with those three. And uh, this website here shows that three of the early church fathers, Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp, wrote letters dated between 95 and 115 AD that quoted from 25 of the 27 New Testament books. The only two books not quote, quoted are very short letters. Jude, which is very short in 2 John. By implication, you could say that if they know 2 John, that they must know 3 John as well. Just, it's not proven, but it's, you know, you can make that conjecture, you can make that inference. Um, and then Jude has, if you're familiar with the book of Jude, it has a lot of the same material that 2 Peter had. Uh, and since it's a very short book, it not being included is more of like an argument from silence than it is saying that they didn't know it. All right. And he goes on to describe how uh, one of the most monumental events, events in the first century was the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And that had such a significant magnitude that FF um, Bruce wrote, one criterion that has special weight with me is the relation which these writings appear to bear, destruction, bear to the destruction of the city and the temple of Jerusalem by the Romans in AD 70. Uh, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, but nowhere in the New Testament books is the destruction of the temple referred to as a past fulfilled prophecy. It's always referred to as something that's going to take place in the future. And that includes Revelation chapter 11, uh, the gospels and several other, the three synoptic gospels as they call them. And then the, um, the other, there are several other references to this throughout the New Testament, which I won't get into in this video, but I, I'll have it elsewhere. This is um, one of the books. Let me get out of this for a minute. This is one of the books. It's called uh, Canon Muratorianus. 
It's by Tregellis. I think that's how you say his name. And this is the earliest category of the books of the New Testament. And I did a little uh, review of this here. Um, this is, I start off with a, um, let's see. I start off with a little discussion of presuppositionalism, which is basically that, you know, you use the Bible uh, to prove the Bible. You use the Bible as the belief system or your epistemology. Okay, so I went over this in the beginning. I'm not going to deal with that extensively, but the Canon Muratorianus is the earliest catalog of the books in the New Testament. It was written by S.P. Tregellis. I think that's how you say his name. He's a I um, believe he was from the British Isles, I think Scotland. I have to get back into that. Um, he's another in a long line of critics who has converted to Christ through an honest examination of the evidence. The book is a series of short papers concerning the Muratorian fragment uh, written in the 1800s. He was one of the first people to re-examine the manuscript after it was published in the 1700s. And he writes to study to correct the errors in the first translation the first textual edition and up to that point and then he gives us several chapters on the significance of the Muratorian canon and establishing the canonicity of the new testament books of each new testament book so the point here is that it's been known since the beginning of christianity that the canon as we know it today has a pedigree that is we have a record in each generation not only of the authors but of the occasion of the writing um, in addition to the testimony of the church fathers, such as Clement, Polycarp, Ignatius, there's also uh, Papias and the Didache from the late first century onward. We have this other smoking gun from the mid second century. Uh, the Can Canon Muratorianus is believed to have been written in, let's see, I'm going to go to this article here. That's a different one. Hang on. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get the exact dates here, but it's it's right in the middle of the second century, like a couple of decades after uh, the Church Fathers. Okay, So it's, it's a very good book. It's very readable. It contains a three-page facsimile of the manuscript, the Latin transcription, and then a line-by-line -line rendering of the translation along with the commentary. Okay, So this is um, a little statement by the author. Accuracy of all accuracy of statement of all points of Christian evidence is of no small importance. If we wish to rise from a mere general and indefinite notion to a clear and distinct apprehension of facts, and as Christianity is a religion based on facts, we have to inquire on what grounds we receive the documents, key word there is receive, in which such facts are transmitted. For thus we shall know how to meet those who would throw distrust or suggest doubt as to this branch of Christian evidence. It behooves us to know from the apostolic age and onward that there has never been a time in which the historic records of our, our religion have not been received, held fast, and publicly used. In other words, the canon um, in every generation is attested to. It didn't just appear 400 years later. It didn't appear in, you know, 80 71 or whenever the last apostle died but it was very early late second late first century early second century something like that and all along there have been the same records as to the fact of our lord's incarnation his death on the cross vicarious sacrifice appointed by god the father his resurrection ascension the mission of the holy ghost and the preaching of the apostles on the lord of uh, of the lord of the doctrine of repentance and remission of sins as name and obedience to his command Okay, so you can read that article. I'll put this down here below. Uh, there's another scholar that I'm really interested in, and her name is um, Edda Linneman, and she wrote two books. One of them is called Biblical Criticism on Trial, and then there's another one called Is There a Synoptic Problem? And here's just a little bit about um, Edda Linneman here. Let me see if we can get into this. Okay, so that's Canon Muratorianus. Edda Linneman 
um, I mentioned her in this article that I have called Dating the Gospel of Luke. I'll put these, I'll put these uh, articles up here as well. When I first started this study, I was really interested in kind of refuting liberal speculation that you know, we don't really know what the correct books in the Bible are and so on. So I have this series I call, you know, Luke the 400 pound gorilla, or I forget what it's called, Luke the 800 pound gorilla, in which that Luke itself is a very interesting testimony that the gospels were written earlier along with the book of Acts, but not gonna get into that um, entirely, but this is one of the earliest uh, manuscripts that we have of the gospels. This is copied at the end of the second century. This is called Papyrus 75 which is a, an actual book, and it ends with um, Evangelion kata Lucan, Evangelion kata Yanan, which is, the, even if you don't read Greek, if you know the Greek alphabet, you know that's the, that's the gospel or the evangel according to Luke, the gospel according to John. And so from the very earliest examples we have of manuscripts from the second century, we have one gospel ending one gospel begin beginning, and I say, even if you can't read Greek, the words there are pretty clear. It says, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to John. So the question becomes, you know, why do we have people who say that the original autographs were anonymous? And there's two reasons for that. One of them is just skepticism, right? There's this uh, scientific skepticism, rank positivism, and then uh, this, the second reason is, is that they will assume the latest date is possible until an earlier day can be established. Uh, so there are two scholars that I'm going to mention. The first one is Etta Linneman and the other one is J.T. Robinsonism. Um, the second reason, excuse me, they, it stated as a foregone conclusion that the author's names were added to the manuscripts later on, perhaps as late as the second century. But, you know, even the church fathers say who the authors were. So it's a little bit difficult to, um, you know, to find that. Um, I'm not gonna get really into this, but I wanna get right into who was, who was Etta Linneman. And um, I wanna mention this really briefly. I was on an internet group um, it's on, was on Yahoo groups. This group no longer exists, but this is the one of the people on the group was Bart Ehrman. And somehow I got on the group. I'm not a textual critic, but I knew some of the people in the group and they, they included me. So one of the questions I asked uh, Bart Ehrman, and he responded to me. Um, I asked him about his insistence that the Gospels were anonymous. Like, how can you say the Gospels were anonymous when we have this, uh, you know, we have this, the first, one of the first, the first codex that we have of the New Testament has the names of the, the authors on there or, you know, according to. So how can you say they're anonymous? And so what he said was that um, by definition, is this really a speculation? I thought it was a truism. A writing whose author does not identify him is anonymous. The authors of the Gospels of the New Testament, unlike other Gospels outside the New Testament and unlike other books in the New Testament, do not indicate their identity. These books are therefore anonymous. If you want to identify the authors with one person or another, that's fine. And you may have historical grounds, but in doing so, you are attributing a book to someone, not indicating what the book itself says about the author. So we had a big discussion over that. Uh, Dan Wallace is on the group as well as some other um, scholars that are conservative. And they're going back and forth with Bart Ehrman on all kinds of stuff, mainly about specific texts that they were studying, manuscripts and so on. but. Um, it says, Ehrman, therefore, so this is something that I called from the discussion. He says, any writing in which an author doesn't identify himself by name in the text itself is by definition anonymous. However, there's absolutely no reason to think that the four gospel authors' names were not known or that they were not part of the titles of the books. Everyone know, and this is an example that someone gave, I thought it was pretty good. Everyone knew who wrote the Annals in ancient time, but Tacitus did not put his name within the text. So we have this book called the Annals of the um, Roman, the Annals of Rome, I think it's called, uh, by Tacitus. Uh, I use that quite a bit in my writings about you know Daniel and uh, first century uh, preterism, that type of thing. But the Annals is not by definition anonymous. It's by Tacitus, even though Tacitus doesn't say 
name himself anywhere in the text. So he's applying a standard to the Gospels that's not applied anywhere else in ancient literature. And I'm sure he has reasons for that, but consider also there were four Gospels, each being copied hundreds of times, all the copies going in hundreds of different geographical locations and directions and ending up thousands of miles apart, yet each was called by the names no matter where they ended up decades later. The logical explanation for this is that they were therefore distributed throughout the known world. The titles and authors of names were affixed to them in some way. All right. I call him an idiot here, which I'm probably going to sound an idiot, but it seems to me it's kind of an idiotic thing to say. I mean that, you know, because you don't name yourself in the text, I don't name myself in any of my books, you know, so it doesn't really make any sense. Um, Let's see. So Edda Lineman, I have a little thing about her down here, and I basically copied the same thing over to um, to this. Let's see. This is a little bio sketch I did on Edda Lineman, if it will load. Oh, here we go. Oops. All right, so this is a really awesome testimony from a German liberal scholar. Anna Linneman was one of the most, form she was one of the foremost scholars in um, what they call you know, textual criticism or higher criticism. She was a student of um, Rudolf Boltmann, who, another, who was another great. Um, so she was a student of Rudolf, Rudolf Boltmann, who is one of the fathers of so-called neo-Orthodox theology. And she was a prodigy whose first book on textual criticism was published shortly after she graduated and became a bestseller. She got swept into the higher critical pantheon of German scholars and is respected icon among liberals for many years. Her later writings are, were ridiculed by liberals because she boils down everything into the most simplistic terms. Basically, this is a person who um, was brought up into, you know, liberal German scholarship and later she actually was converted to christ through a power encounter when she was almost at retirement age she was always had this nagging misgiving about the liberal bias towards supernatural and authentic authorship the reason why liberals don't accept that the gospels and the new testament were written by eyewitnesses is that they don't believe in supernatural miracles of the bible so they say there's no way that matthew could have written matthew that you know, John could have written John because Jesus didn't perform miracles and they're just, you know, either making it up or they're passing down an oral tradition that was developed, you know, many decades later, like, you know, Jesus died in AD 30. So they're placing the dates of these books at, you know, 70 AD, 80 AD, even into the second century. And as the liberals progressed, they kept putting the names of the gospel, they kept putting the dates of the gospels and the New Testament uh, books later and later, even towards the end of the second century. And a lot of that's been disproved um, categorically. But, um, you know, what happened was, um, you know, she basically would start her lectures um, and she would say that um, this is a testimony that she wrote here. And I'll post all of this later. But she would give lectures after she was converted. What happened was she went into a a uh, charismatic fellowship and she had this power encounter where she actually witnessed healings people you know people that students always wanted to pray for her they invited her to prayer meetings so she finally went to one of these prayer meetings when she was actually having a real problem they prayed for her she found an answer to prayer and she found people getting answers to prayer during these meetings even healings and things like that people would be healed uh, of sicknesses and so on and so she was converted to Christ. She witnessed supernatural hearings and prayer meetings. And so their barrier between her acceptance of the authentic was removed. And she said that was the only reason really why she rejected it and why many other scholars rejected it too. So from then on, she'd begin, telling, begin her lectures by telling students that if they'd ever read any of her earlier books, they should throw them in the trash. And then she wrote a few short books refuting her earlier views. I have two of them. This is, uh, you know, biblical criticism on trial. The other one is called, is there a synoptic problem? And then she spent the rest of her life as a missionary of Indonesia and then died a few years later. I mean, she had many years after this, but she never really wrote 
uh, prodigiously like before, except for a few short books. And these are, you know, mainly um, ignored by her former colleagues. And she just presents the data very briefly. And then her conclusion, she doesn't waste a lot of time explaining how she got there, but she's able to cut through a lot of what I call the extraneous nonsense. You know, she, she has this ability that's very irksome to her critics. I had this online uh, conversation with one of her former students and he was really upset that she used to tell her students to throw away all my other books, they're trash, you know, so on. Okay, so this is the data Lineman testimony. I'll, I'll uh, this is, she wrote this shortly before her death apparently. She gave a lecture. This is another book called Eyewitness to Jesus. This is by, I have it here, oops. Carson Feed. And this is from Amazon. I, I really, re, I really um, recommend these books. Um, if you want to spend, you know, 15 to 20 dollars on each of these, they're very worthwhile having. Um, this is from 1994. So this is fairly recent. Like this is this is within the last 30 years. And it says that Christmas Eve 1994 would have come and gone like any others had it not been for three tiny papyrus scraps, fragments discussed in the Times of London's sensational front page story. So this is a book written by Carson Deed based on some articles and interviews that he did. Uh, there was this old papyrus. It was called P, it was fragment five from cave seven of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And then there was also the Magdalen papyri, which are shorter. And he did, for centuries, people thought this is a very early um, version of Matthew, has some uh, some passages from Matthew. You see the scraps are very small, but it's it's identifiable as, you can kind of lay out the page and you can see how it's part of the Gospel of Matthew. And for many, many years, people said that it was, um, you know, AD 180 to, 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 to 200. So, you know, close to 150 years after Matthew was purportedly written. But T had redated them to roughly AD 60. Okay. Um, and so, you know, here we have a first century copy of the Gospel. It says, what was the fuss? all about how can three ancient papyri fragments be so significant? How did Teed, Tida, as you say in German, Tida, I say Thied, but um, how did he arrive at this radical early dating? What does it mean to the average Christian? So it's a very good book. And uh, there's another papyri scrap that he identified called Fragment 5. And this one was actually found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it, he says it's a fragment of the Gospel of Mark. It's very small. Uh, there's some controversy over what it says, but it's definitely prior to AD 70. And he dates it to 66. <laughs> so we have, he's, he's saying that we actually have fragments of papyri that are from the 60s, which is about when we think that they were written. You know, that's the earliest date that even conservative scholars give to these books. And I'm going to discuss that in a minute, but... The reason why this guy just isn't laughed out of the room is that he was a very he was a very credible um, papyrologist and paleographer. He was able to identify certain manuscripts that no one else was able to identify, and he turned out to be right about all of them. And then he came up with these, and so he um, was very um, respected in his field. Papyrology is the uh, study of paper, like papyrus pieces and you know, dating them. And then uh, paleography is a uh, study of handwriting. So the idea is like, if you were to take a handwritten high school, um, you know, essay written by my father, high school essay written by myself, and then one written today by some students of today, you could tell by the type of paper, what decade that this was from. You know, you could say this is 1950s, notebook paper, this is 1970s notebook paper, this is modern day notebook paper. And you could tell just by looking at the paper, uh, the type of ink and the lines and so on. And then you could also tell by the handwriting, this is a style of script that was used in the 1950s compared to someone my age who may have written a little bit differently. 
Uh, and then you have today the type of handwriting that students use today, which is very rarely script, by the way. So that's, and it's fairly accurate. You can get down to, um, you know, sometimes a decade, but definitely within the generation. So that's why you said this is not, these are not manuscripts from, I mean, this one right here, uh, this one is was from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we know that the Qumran community ceased after the first century. Okay. So this is Karsten Thieve here. So that's that. Um, this is another article I'm going to post. This is called John H. Ludlam, John Henry Ludlam Jr. Uh, he's a very little known scholar. He wrote a series of articles. He was a kind of a prodigy. He was a graduate of Yale Divinity School and his uh, PhD thesis, which was the higher level um, thesis was on biblical languages. And he had, he studied six ancient languages and he got perfect scores in his PhD oral examinations, which is something that had never happened at Yale Divinity School. Like he had 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, 4.0. So he had, you know, uh, six sections or six majors in his degree on these. So he was a foreign language prodigy and he spent most of his life uh, studying the German higher critics who he thought to be baseless, but he was a liberal and you know, too often conservatives are con corrupted by seminary education. He began as a liberal, but he was a skeptic of the skeptics. <laughs> he would, became extremely fluent in several languages. And he began to scrutinize the very source of liberal theology, which is the German critics. So he knew German very well. He knew uh, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, um, I think Aramaic. I forget what the other language was. But um, so he he wrote this series of articles in Christianity Today, which ended up being a debate called New Light on the Synoptic Problem. Are we sure of Mark's priority? And you can look those up. I should. You can also read a limited version on Google Books, which is see if this still exists here. Yeah. Nope, that's uh, what's going on there. Anyway, that's just a problem with my browser. Don't pay attention to that. And then I have a series of, uh, this is a series of, interviews that we did with um, David Lutzweiler, who is a friend of, uh, he was a friend of, these are only in 240p, but he was a friend of Henry David Ludlam. And he kind of goes through and he explains the whole, the whole background of that. So that's very interesting too. Um, I have here on this page, his, one of his lectures. Well, let's see where this is. Where did this go? There we go. This is one of his lectures. I have to clean this up a bit because there's like a lot of Greek in here and some of the formatting is messed up, but this is a fairly lengthy manuscript of a, uh, you see some of this is, I need to go through this and clean that up. But this is a, a fairly lengthy uh, manuscript that he did, which was the basis for a series of lectures. Okay. So the point of all of this just to sum up, is that I began this series as kind of a, it was a challenge that some Catholic friends were challenging this. They're saying that sola scriptura can't be true. And one of the reasons was that, you know, the Bible itself doesn't teach sola scriptura. And even if it did, it doesn't tell you what books belong in the Bible. So I say the Bible is self-authenticating and that it didn't take hundreds of years to find the canon that People knew it as soon as the books existed, people who knew the apostles received the books and then people who knew the people who knew the apostles. And there hasn't been a generation since then that people haven't ascribed to 27 books of the New Testament. The Old Testament is a different issue. We can get into that in another series, maybe in the future. But what I wanted to say was I began with a concern about liberalism and that there are a lot of Christians who are... Um, kind of like seduced into believing some of the claims of liberalism. This is a book called The Jesus Crisis, The Inroads of Historical Criticism into Evangelical Scholarship. I'll put, post a link to this book too. This is very good. And then this is another book called um, The Three Views on the Origins of the Synoptic Gospels. I don't have a definite view on the, on the 
synoptic gospels. I think that um, they were probably independent. This is actually the view of Robinson too, who's a liberal. I didn't get into him too much, but J.T. Robinson was a, a liberal who taught that um, for many years that the books were written later, like all liberals did. And he said that, you know, just on a lark, he said, just as, a, as an intellectual exercise, he started to write a thesis arguing like from the devil's advocate against the liberalism, saying that uh, the gospels are all actually written early. And the one thing he kept running into is that the, go the gospels, the epistles and the book of Revelation repeatedly refer to the temple as still being standing and the temple's destruction, the prophecy about the temple's destruction in the book of Daniel, which was written many years earlier. No one debates that. But Jesus refers to this prophecy in Daniel about the temple's destruction. But nowhere in the New Testament are the, you know, nowhere in the New Testament is this referred to as a past act. So I think I have something here on, um, let's see if I can find it real quick here. Um, well, anyway, there's a, there's a, um, I'll probably come back and talk about J.T. Robinson. I'll do a part five, but um, God bless. I, if you, if you like this video, please share it with people. You can subscribe and uh, I'm going to put a link list of the link, list of the books below. Um, I have a book called why creeds and confessions, which actually gets into some of these issues. So God bless. And I will see you in the next video.